but I have a, this entire roadmap of things I look at with my clients and I, I call it, it's either my roadmap or there are roadblocks. And obviously starting with the foundation is, is again, how we feel about ourselves, how we feel about our bodies, because that can be the biggest block to get wanting to get into the bedroom. Ooh, she had me at get into the bedroom. Ah, uh, yes. It is time for some pillow talk on Holistically Speaking with guest Dr. Renee Wellenstein as she answers your questions about how to get out of your head and in touch with your body and your partners. Here we go. Hi, I'm Hilary Russo. Thanks for joining me for the Holistically Speaking podcast. I'm a certified holistic health coach and havening techniques practitioner, lover of great conversation, and of course, clever wordplay, holistically speaking. So welcome to an empowering place where my guests share their transformational stories of trauma to triumph through health, healing, and humor. It's the ultimate brain candy as we find out who we are, how we got that way, and what it takes to be a happy and healthy grown-up. And be kind to your mind. I'm glad you're here. Can we talk about intimacy here? Oh, yeah. We're going there. Because let's face it, at some point or another, we wonder what is going on in the bedroom or maybe what's not going on. The big question here is this. What is holding some women back from even wanting to step foot in the bedroom? Look, Everyone's normal is different. And many times, simple changes could open up an entire world of what's happening or not happening between the sheets. And if there is anyone that knows all about this, it is the libidoologist, Dr. Renee Wellenstein. I mean, the name alone says this gal knows what she's talking about. Libidoologist? Come on. But if you must know, Dr. Renee is also a double board certified OBGYN who has been working with women for over 20 years. And guys, you'll want to tune in if you have questions of your own. You see, Dr. Renee isn't just supporting her patients. She faced some of her own health battles. And when she turned to functional medicine, things shifted in her life as well as for her patients. And hopefully after this conversation, you'll see things differently too. So on this episode, we're covering everything from hormones to other health concerns that could be holding you back and you didn't even know it. We'll even talk nutrition. And because you're joining the conversation, Dr. Renee is even sharing her top 100 libido boosting foods. Hmm, sign me up. Not to mention her favorite supplements and my favorite topics, holistically speaking from experience, how using essential oils and touch can really rev things up. So turn on the AC because we're turning up the heat and living libido loca on this episode of Holistically Speaking. Oh, I'm really excited for this one. <laughs> I don't think I've ever squealed on my podcast, Renee. <laughs> Yay! I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> this is such a great topic. Everybody, we have Dr. Renee Wellenstein here. She is the libidoologist. Yes, you heard me correctly. And that's exactly where we are going today on Holistically Speaking. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to talk about this. Yes, this is a topic that got a lot of traction when I asked the question. I have Dr. Renee mm -hmm. coming on the show, so we have a bunch of questions for you at some point during our conversation. But I want to start by how does somebody get into this? You're a double board certified OBGYN. You were doing traditional Western medicine practice. You got more into the functional medicine, which is where you stay now. And but there's a story behind that, as there always is. And I think mm -hmm. I'd love to know how you really got into the work of really focusing on the libido and how you are supporting women on this journey. What's your own story? Yes, I do have quite the story. And I'll try to condense it because it's, you know, about a two to three year story. <laughs> I certainly never thought I would be sitting here talking to you about functional medicine, libido, because I was conventionally trained as an OBGYN. And that is how I thought I was going to live the rest of my life, delivering babies and operating. And um, in 2012, uh, we had already moved to the country from a suburb of New York City just to kind of escape the busyness. I had, at this point, one-year-old boy-girl twins. And, you know, what do you do when you move to the country? You get the dream horse that you've always wanted since you were a little girl. I was a daughter of a dairy farmer. At the age of seven, I asked my dad, can I get a horse? And he says, no. <laughs> so at the age of 39, I said, I'm getting my horse. 
So I got the horse and I can't even tell you, it's really a blur as far as timeline goes, but I fell off that horse and broke my back. And I always say that's where my, my story begins because that's when I was, I was at this point going 150 miles per hour. However, that's the only life I ever knew. I was, um, I thought living the dream life. And it's when I came to the screeching halt that over the next two to three years, I really had to look at my life on so many levels. But acutely, right after the uh, accident, I had broken my back. I had broken uh, four bones in my back, and it pretty much put me out of commission, at least for my job, for uh, six months. I was, you know, using a walker, a shower chair, all the things, and very dependent on narcotics. And at the six month mark, I finally had a procedure to get me off narcotics because the injury I had was inoperable. I was Humpty Dumpty that fell off the wall that couldn't be put back Mm. together again. And at first I was like, oh, thank God you're not going to cut my back open. But at, you know, the six week mark, when I was told that I was going to be all better and I wasn't, it's really, you shouldn't tell a type A overachieving doctor that the timeline is six months and you're going to be better. And when you don't meet that, especially a woman, we feel like a failure, right? Like there's something wrong with me. So I, um, at six months had a procedure finally to at least get me off the narcotics, but I returned back to work, uh, very limited scope of practice. And I quickly realized over the next year plus that my full scope of OBGYN was no longer, I could no longer deliver or operate due to the back injury. So, you know, this year was filled with a lot of, um, emotions, a lot, you know, I, I, I now in retrospect realized I had gone through the grieving process after my injury. I was angry, resentful, all of the things, um, looking around me, I essentially became kind of a hermit in my house. Aside from going to work, I really stayed in my house. I thought everyone was talking about me because I do live in a small town. And so there was a lot of emotions. I didn't feel fulfilled at work anymore. I'd often come home saying, gosh, I'm just not changing lives anymore. I'm in the clinic. I'm doing pap smears. That's it. I'm not delivering the babies and not operating. So, you know, there is something to be said by waking up with a sense of purpose every day. And, and when you don't have that, it's, it's, pretty um, eye-opening as far as like, what am I going to do now? Yeah. And so, you know, at this point I was contemplating other careers in medicine, but I I got a book and essentially the only things in this book that they said I could do aside from working in a hospital or in an office was work for a male practice company or, you know, or be an expert witness or work for a pharmaceutical company. I'm like, no, 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 (laughs) that does not light me up. Coincidentally, at the same time, I was starting to have some a lot of a lot of physical symptoms. I was I couldn't get out of bed in the morning. I was really dragging throughout the day. I was gaining weight. My self esteem and confidence were really at an all time low. Um, I was really having intense cravings, sugar, salt, all these things. And my my tipping point was when I laid in bed one night with my husband and I said, I just can't go on living like this. This is not what I pictured my life. I have no purpose. I feel awful. And mind you, at this point, I had already flunked out of physical therapy. And, uh, you know, a lot of my doctors were like, we don't know what else to do to you or for you. So I went to my doctor knowing, again, because I'm in the conventional world of medicine, that I know what box I'm probably going to be shoved into. And lo and behold, I went to her and she says, I think you have depression. And I remember thinking at that moment, gosh, I just don't feel like this is what depression should feel like. You know, I know I had had a life-changing injury I know my life doesn't look the same as it had, you know, one or two years ago, but like, I just don't feel like this is what it feels like. But again, in that mentality, I just want to feel better. Give me that pill. So I went on an antidepressant and lo and behold, uh, three months later, when I went back to see her for a medication checkup, I actually did not feel better. Actually, I felt worse because I had all the side effects from the medication. And in the conventional world, if a medication fails, you don't think that you have the wrong diagnosis. You think you have the wrong medication. So she prescribed a second and, you know, nothing against my doctor. She was doing all that she knew. And I took it because I was so desperate at this point to feel better. And same thing happened. And at this point, I'm thinking that gut feeling was right. Like I, this is, this is not depression, but what is it? Coincidentally, at the same time, um, it's funny how the universe works to kind of put people in your life when you need them. I recognize that now. I didn't back then, but I had been selling anti-aging skincare because speaking of purpose, I was just grasping for straws. Give me something fun to do in my life. Let's do direct sales. Like this is something I've (laughs) never done. 
And this doctor was an anti-aging doctor. So we got put in contact one evening at like nine o'clock at night. I hop in bed with my computer and she uh, quickly says, I don't want your skincare. I have my own. I'm like, okay, thank you. She politely declined, but we moved right on to my health. And at this point, I didn't even know what a functional medicine doc was, but I was like, no one else is helping me. What do you have? Right? So she's like, I don't think you have depression. I think you have this condition called adrenal fatigue. And I was like, oh, what is that? And I'm Googled it as soon as she said, it. I was like, what is this adrenal fatigue? And I was blown away by the fact that this was me staring, these words staring on the screen were exactly how I felt. And I didn't know this. I am a doctor. I had gone through all this training and how did I not know this? And so at this point, and she's like, you know, your symptoms are not in your head, even though you think you're crazy, they're, you know, they're not in your head. This is what you have. And so she said, of course, we have to confirm it with some testing, but this is exactly sounds like you. And I'm like, this exactly sounds like me. Gave me a little treatment plan right on the heels of that. She said, how about joining me in practice? <laughs> and I was like, quickly Googled functional medicine. because I had <laughs> no idea what that was. And I have to tell you, this was that turning moment. I was like, this is my purpose. This is what mm. I've been looking for, for the past two years of how am I going to change women's lives again through functional medicine? And this woman changed my life in one night so many ways. Number one, she validated my symptoms, which I think so many women out there think that because it can't be, their symptom can't be fixed with a pill or they can't be shoved in a diagnosis box like me, that their symptoms are non-existent, that they're crazy, that they're lazy, that they're unmotivated, that whatever, whatever label we want to put on ourselves. So she validated the fact that my symptoms were real. Number two, that I was going to be feeling better. Uh, I was going to get back to myself. So she gave me my hope back that I could actually live a, a normal life again. And she just gave me my purpose back. She gave me, you know, this job of, mm -hmm. it, and opened up my eyes to functional medicine. And the funniest story about this, the funniest part about the story is my husband came out of the shower because he had gone in right at the beginning of the phone call. And he comes out and I said, honey, great news. I don't have depression. I have this thing called adrenal fatigue. I don't need any medication prescription. I just some supplements and lifestyle changes and I'm going to be better. Oh, and by the way, I'm leaving the hospital and I'm going back and doing a, a fellowship in <laughs> functional medicine. And I'm joining this woman I just met on the phone in practice in about, I don't know, it's like eight months from now. And he was like, how long was I in the shower for? <laughs> and really, this is a time that I realized like there has been so much in my life that has like my body has said the yes, but as a conventionally trained doctor, I suppress it because we are trained to think with, think with our heads, not yeah. with our but not with our feelings. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so that's how I got into functional medicine. It exactly happened. As I said that night, I started the fellowship online through the uh, University of South Florida and did that along with working as an OBGYN, finished out my time at the hospital, uh, took a couple months off to kind of study for my boards. And then I jumped into uh, within, gosh, what, eight months, nine months, uh, a practice uh, in functional medicine. Mm. What was the timeline for all of this, Renee? January of, I think it was 2014 to September. So I decided end of January, actually, and I began the beginning of September. I mean, isn't it amazing how we have these, these synchronicities and these falling in twos mm -hmm. in our lives? So we, we can go from like, and this happens so much. What's my purpose? Especially after you have kids or after something shifts in your life or you have some kind of a trauma or something that just triggers you where you're like, what's it all about? And then if you just sit in the silence or just put yourself in a place where you're open to possibility, mm -hmm. the answers come and and, yeah. and the gifts are bestowed upon us, right? Yeah, I think it's such an amazing story. So here you are going into the field of functional medicine. And was it hard to leave behind all those babies? It was. <laughs> you know, it, that was the other thing that was really eye-opening. Like, so many docs, we're, we're full of ego. We're full of like, oh, we've gone to school. We know better than you. We we're the experts and we are, I mean, we're not better than anybody, but we are the experts in our field. But I really had to put that ego aside when it came to my ability to perform my job safely. And at the end of the day, if it's three o'clock in the morning and I get hit with my back issues and I can't think of anything but sitting down, laying down and I got to get a baby out of a belly, that's not good. Yeah. There's no one to save the day. I admit, you know, the buck stops with me. And that's at the physician level. That's what happens. Like you are, you are it, especially in the middle of the night as an OBGYN. So I really had to swallow my pride. 
Uh, it was hard. I'm not going to lie because I trained and given so much of my life for this career. And, um, but at the end of the day, I'm like, I'm not going to risk a mommy's life, a baby's life just for my ego. And, um, so yeah, I walked away from it and, you know, I tried again to stay in that conventional world. Cause that's, it's really where I wanted to stay at that point in my life. But in the capacity that I was able to do, it was just not, it was just not changing anybody's life, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, the patient or mine. It's hard again, to walk away from something that you think is, is this is my gift. This is what I want yeah. to do to the world or give to the world. When you think you were born, how, when did you know you wanted to be a doctor? Oh gosh. Uh, probably senior year of um, high school. Yeah. I went through, let's see, a flight attendant. <laughs> I was too tall though. I'm six foot one. Uh, then a marine biologist, but then I would have to move to the South uh, and live in Florida or something like that. I don't know. I rarely, and then I went into like, oh, thick. okay, I think biology, I think a doctor. And it was really interesting. I was told I wasn't good enough by my guidance mm. counselors. Even though I graduated second in my class, I still wasn't good enough. How many of these things that we get told throughout our life, of like, you're not good enough. You're going to have, you know, you're never going to get in. And, and I, I graduated second. I mean, like two tenths of a point behind the first in my class. How do you tell me I'm not good enough? But Anyhow, um, I'm a success story. I'm here. You I'm are. Here. Yeah. Yeah. And who's, and whose story really is that? I mean, then, then that becomes part of our story. Somebody right. else's, somebody else's fears, somebody else's issues. And it just goes to show you that you have to follow your path and your dream mm-hmm. and listen to your voice and your higher self. Right. Yep. Uh, because that happens so often. We hear that I'm not good enough and you mm-hmm. need the accolades and you need to be mm-hmm. reassured. And the really, the only one that you need to be reassured about or from Mm -hmm. is you listening Mm -hmm. to you and your inner voice. And that kind of goes into this, the next area I wanted to talk to you about, because I know we talked about this briefly, because it all seems to kind of come together. But there was a point in your life where you were chasing the accolades, you were Mm -hmm. chasing the perfect physical body, being this tall, Mm -hmm. lean, beautiful woman, you got into bodybuilding. And that Mm -hmm. is a that is an area that fascinates me because it Mm -hmm. is so dependent on your physical feature and appearance. Mm -hmm. Were you doing that while you were a doctor? Oh, yeah. 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 I just did it not too long ago. Yeah. I did it after my injury. I I have that personality of you tell me I can't, I will, which is what was frustrating me at the six week mark when I, you know, they told me I'd be better and I wasn't. I'm like, this is not me. I don't fail. Like I've, I've never failed in my life. And now I'm failing at the six week post injury. And, you know, after that, and what I realized uh, a couple years out um, was, I woke up one morning, it was May of, gosh, it must've been 2014 also. It was kind of the same year as I started my functional medicine training. Actually, it's really interesting because my recovery with adrenal issues really gave me some energy back to start thinking about my future and this, and hope obviously. And this is, it was that May of that same year. So I was doing all of this stuff that I actually woke up one morning. I said, you know what? No one's going to get me back into physical shape of myself. No one's going to do it for me. Only I can do it. Only I can lose this weight. Only I can get in shape again. And I knew at the end of the day, that was actually going to make my, my back pain better. Uh, and the doctors kept telling me that, but I was just like, give me the magic pill. Give me the magic exercise, you know? And it, it was hard work. I'm not going to lie, you know, to lose. And it was only 10 pounds, but gosh, you know, it was all around my middle, around my back. And it's just that confidence that I, uh, that I got from just, knowing that I could finally do it again, you know, and having the energy to do it and the motivation to do it. And that had been lost for so long. Like I could care less a year prior for any of this. And so I actually had lost the weight. I started changing everybody's life in my house because my husband said, what are you doing every day in the basement? Because I I did this completely undercover. Like I was down in my basement working out every morning before the kids got up. And and I'll say undercover because I would go to the gym to try to improve my health and my strength. And I would, I was confronted by many in the gym saying, are you supposed to be here? What are you doing here? All these things. And so there was a lot of judgment around my injury and my recovery. So I basically, and again, I live in a small town, so my business is everybody's business. And, or at least I thought, and at that, there's a brief time in my life around then that I actually cared what people thought. So I just took my recovery back home in the confines of my basement and I remember one morning, my husband's like, what have you been doing every morning before we all get up? And I said, I go down to the basement. I do my little workout. And he's like, wow, you, you like, you look better. You look like you're feeling a little bit better. You're, you know, like just, just this perception of, of how I presented myself to the world of, it was just much different. 
And so he's like, can I, can I start doing what you're doing? And so it, his health changed at that moment too, too, because it was May that I started probably around September. He really started taking notice of the fact that I was eating better, that I was exercising. And then of course it trickles down to the kids. You know, as soon as I get hubby on board, it's like, okay, let's really make a conscious effort to make healthier meals. And it was the following July that I was like, ah, I got to kick this up a notch because you know what? You told me I couldn't get strong again and look at me, I'm stronger. So let me just do the next challenging thing, which is a bodybuilding competition. And, you know, it's interesting because I kind of did that as a role model for others. I have an injury or chronic pain. Number one, all of the workouts I had done up till then really helped strengthen my core and my back. So it really did help manage the pain on so many levels. I've actually had a couple of doctors comment how, you know, that really, they think that that really helped me stay off a lot of the chronic medications that I was so adamant to get off of that were harming my liver and my kidneys. But um, it was a lot about the nutrition, the diet part, which isn't always the healthiest. And, you know, so I always want to say that, you know, you don't have to be always the strongest and the biggest muscles. It was, it was a lot about the dedication, determination, discipline, and the diet. <laughs> the diet was huge and it was probably the hardest part. So, um, and it was very time consuming. It was like a second job, but I, I felt at that point still in my life, I had something to prove. It's kind of going back to what that guidance counselor told me, you know, you're not good enough. Like I carried that with me my whole life. And, you know, not only am I not good enough now that, but I had an injury, so I'm really not good enough. So let me show you that I am good enough and I'm better than good. And I'm going to get on that stage. So how did you get over that feeling of I'm not good enough? I mean, what was the real transformation and transition? Well, you know, I did competitions for two years and I have to say it was really interesting now that I'm out of it. Um, not to say anyone who does it, it's a bad thing. It just is not always the healthiest lifestyle and the healthiest mindset of a lifestyle because you're always comparing yourself. You know, think about it. You're standing on stage where a judge is judging you, right? Like you are getting compared to others. Like that is the ultimate, like, am I, if I get second, I'm not good enough kind of thing. And so I feel like that whole that whole scene just perpetuated that not good enough, especially if I walk away from a competition, I didn't get first, you know, where it was a blow to, I, I did very well the first competition, second, not as well as I had told, hoped third, I got my pro card. So that was the icing on the cake. And I would have continued, but the following January, so I had finished competing in, in November, it was kind of my season off until the following uh, fall. And, um, I woke up one morning to an email from my boss saying that we're going to have to close our medical office. And the, the same boss that changed my life, she's wonderful, but it was for financial reasons. And my options were either I work harder. And at this point I was in the office three days a week, but essentially working six because I'd bring charts home. Functional medicine is, is great, but it's not easy. You know, mm. it's a lot of thinking outside the box. It's like a lot of and a lot of my work on the weekends was writing all the labs out, all the description for my patients, kind of grasping my head around like what could be going on. If this isn't working, what else could we try? Uh, so it's a lot of um, indiv obviously individualized medicine. So a lot of that I would do outside of the office. So when I'm actually in the office with my patients, I am with my patients. I'm all about being present. Like I am not about taking notes. I'm not about looking things up. I'm not about transcribing labs and other doctors do that. And that's always what's held me back with being efficient as far as patient care, because I am all about literally listening. I did this in OBGYN and still did it in functional medicine. So I would, at the expense of me taking a lot of work home to, um, and so, you know, it was either be more efficient in the office and not take as much home, which means compromising my, what my feelings are compromising patient care, or you work more, um, more hours in the office and take less vacation. And uh, I wasn't really taking much vacation. And ironically, our office was called quality of life medicine. And I was like, uh, there's not much. And at this point too, I was feeling really burned out. I mean, yeah. obviously the competitions did not help, but like I was, I had a two hour commute a day, um, you know, and on top of being a mom of twins and a husband that worked at the hospital. So I was doing it all. And I was just like, there's, I'm such a hypocrite. Like I am so burned out. I'm so tired. I'm not walking the walk, talking the talk. So how am I going to continue this? Um, so at that, that day, a couple things happened. Number one, I walked away from that practice. Uh, we gave it, you know, we closed it three months later. Uh, and it was hard again to walk away from the patients, which just always been the hardest part. When I left OB, it was hard to walk away from my actual patients. 
And with this, it was hard to walk away because in my area, there's not much of a, um, a resource for Mm -hmm. my patients. You know, I had a lot of patients coming from three hours away and then obviously there were some local and they were like, what do we do now? (laughs) You know? Mm -hmm. Um, so that was really hard. And, uh, the other thing it did for me is it snapped me out of that bodybuilding trance that I was in Mm. and, uh, you know, realizing that I don't need that trophy to feel good enough. And it really, I have to say, that's probably this, I've always been working on, I don't say always been working on my mindset. I would say this, the past seven, eight years I've been working on, on my head, on my mindset, because I knew that was the biggest thing holding me back from so many things in my life, including my, my optimal health. And, you know, this, this losing my job was like, wow, why do I need a trophy? Why do I have to keep chasing things to make me feel like I'm good enough that I'm worthy? And I snapped out of it and left the bodybuilding world behind, um, kind of recognizing in retrospect that it wasn't the healthiest time of my life, Mm -hmm. but it was actually, it was part of my growing. It was part of my experience. It was part of, part of who I am. And, um, I feel like something I had to go through to get to where I am today. Yeah. And I love, I love the journey that, I mean, look, we never really like the journey while we're going through it sometimes, but like we have to enjoy and we have to be open to receiving the process and the outcome. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people are just looking at the outcome and this is what I tell my clients all the time. It's like the the outcome looks amazing. I love that you're creating that visual for yourself. And sometimes people don't even know exactly what that visual is and what the outcome really that they want. What is my purpose? Mm -hmm. But enjoy the process while you're going there. And when we're in, when we're in it, it's really hard to enjoy it, especially if it's not positive stuff. Right. But looking back on it now and seeing all that you've created and being able to kind of turn make the trajectory of things that is actually turned to more of like what aligns with who you are as a person mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. all that happened even the even the traumas that have happened in your life have turned into these triumphs uh yep. that that's just i mean you have to sit there for a second and honestly just be witness to that and think huh yeah right yeah. i mean what comes yeah. to mind i mean so you know i i feel like um well, I, I always say I never wanted a back injury. Uh, and while I had a really difficult time in the initial part, uh, it led me to who I am today. And, you know, all of that growing and experience mm-hmm. over the past nine plus years now is just been incredible. And I, and while I look back and wish that it was a straighter from point A to point B was much straighter and not so convoluted, I, I just wouldn't be the the person I am, the wife I am, the mom I am, and the doctor I am today without all of those obstacles and side, you know, like the weaving that I had to do to get to where I am today. So um, I'm just, I'm just grateful that I came out the other side. I'm grateful I kept going um, and never gave up. And I'm grateful I believed in myself when no one else, I felt nobody else did Mm -hmm. right from being a little girl right on up, you know? So I just kept believing in myself. Amazing. Love that. Uh, so I want to touch on something real quick. Uh, you know, if you're listening to Dr. Renee on Holistically Speaking, she is the libidoologist in Yes, We Are Going to Talk About the Libido. We're getting there. <laughs> uh, she talks about nutrition. And I want to also mention that she is graciously uh, giving away her 100 libido boosting foods as a download for those of you who are listening, which is amazing because mm-hmm. food is important. You talk about how mm-hmm. food was important even when you were bodybuilding, but really where you saw the change was when you were in your healing journey, getting off the Mm -hmm. pharma, getting into like the more healing of what food can do for us. And, you Mm -hmm. know, as an integrative nutrition health coach and practitioner, I know the importance of food. It's not the only thing that's important, obviously, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. it's what we call the primary secondary wheel, but what we put in our body does matter. It could heal us. It could hurt us. So Mm -hmm. she's got that download to share. And of course you're listening to us on Squadcast. My friends at Squadcast provide the space for us to record and have these amazing conversations. And uh, I am just really elated that you're here sharing more. So maybe we get to some of those questions that our listeners have. What do you think? Yeah, let's go for it. (laughs) Let's bring it up. Okay, so here we go. So we got a couple from all over the country. And this one is, uh, I love that. I love that I get the older women as well. So Barbara from Arizona asked, what do you do when you have trouble finding the libido? And she's 81 and three quarters, three quarters. Let's just stress that. She's 81 and three quarters years of age. So Barbara, 
Let's see what she, let's see what Dr. Renee yeah. has to say. So we'll pull it back just a little bit. So where I come from libido, a lot of two things. Number one, a lot of people think I'm just going to hit the bedroom and <laughs> I work with women and a lot of women don't even want to get into the bedroom. So we have to start, my goal is to get you to want to go into the bedroom. And then that's the icing on the cake when we get in there, but like pull it back. Like I have to work on why don't we want to go into the bedroom? What is holding us back? The second thing is everyone thinks I'm always, always going to sit here and talk about hormones. Again, hormones are icing on the cake. There's a lot of things we can do, including with nutrition to help balance our hormones that we may not even need the hormones at the end of the day. So I don't always come on podcasts and say, oh, take this hormone, that hormone. Not, I'm not against bioidentical hormones by any means. I think there's a place for them. I think they're so beneficial for so many things and may be part of the solution parts, but they're not the fix it. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm also coming across all platforms to say there's no one magic pill ladies. Like we are much more complex than that. And believe me, I've been studying libido and women for over 20 years. I have tried all of the quote unquote magic pills. They don't work, which mm-hmm. has got me, it kept me asking like, what else could it be? What else could it be? And the last point I want to make before I get to Barbara's question is that when I talk about low libido, it's, it's, it's your, it's your desire to be intimate, to have connection and yes, to have sex, but like, let's bring it back to just wanting to even be touched, to be connected with, you know, like a lot of women don't even want, don't come near me. Don't touch me. Like you can't, uh, have sex without being touched. Right. I mean, yeah, I don't think so. (laughs) So like we have to bring it way back. And when it comes to libido and maybe it's just holding hands or cuddling, maybe that's where we start, but if your libido and what is low, it's not a frequency of connection, intimacy, or the actual act of sex. It is, if it's not where you want it to be, and it sounds like Barbara may not want to be where she wants to be, then that's low for you. Yeah. Right. And, you know, so I want to get it to the point where you are happy. I have had couples, uh, a menopausal woman who had worked with me, who came to me a low libido and she thought hers was low, but when she talked to her partner, they were right on the same level. Their frequency was exactly where they both wanted it to be. Mm-hmm. And, they're, and they brought it down to like, yes, the, the actual intercourse and that there's also the intimacy connection part, which they did a lot more of, which satisfied both of their needs. So I want to just sort of preface the answer to the question that it doesn't, you know, everybody's normal is different. And if it is not where you want it to be. Um, then it's low for you. Mm-hmm. When it comes to Barbara, you know, my first question is, do you want to find it? You know, like, again, it's kind of coming back to the low, like, I'm not here to say you have to be intimate. Uh, connection with, with loved ones is great, whether it be a partner or, you know, it increases a hormone called oxytocin, which is mm-hmm. hugely beneficial to so many things, including our stress level. Um, but if you do want to be intimate, you have to start asking, like, for instance, a lot of my menopausal women, if it's hasn't been used in a while, well, that might be an issue because it might be painful, right? If your girly parts haven't, there hasn't, nothing's seen it for a couple of years, there are things you can do. There are lubricants, there's um, vaginal moisturizers, there are actually vaginal dilators that you can actually just use on yourself to kind of think, get things primed and ready mm-hmm. if that is what's holding you back. And I find a lot of women who Ironically, a lot of women that are in their 70s, 80s actually have a healthier sex drive than some of my 20, 30 year olds. So that's really got me. Yeah, that Mm -hmm. got me asked like that. When I started making that observation in my patients, I'm like, wow, so it's probably, it may not be hormonal. That may not be the whole answer. You know, and it may, we, and we ladies, and I'm perimenopause, I'm getting there (laughs) very closely to that next transition. And I, and I do not, I welcome menopause, actually. It's just another stage of our life. And I do think that we, we always think, oh gosh, menopause, vaginal dryness. Oh gosh, no more sex life, you know? And these patients of mine and these clients are like, no, gosh, I, it's better than ever. Because I think a couple of things, number one, women know who they are at, at yeah. you know, 50, 40, late forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, eighties. We know what we, who we are. We know what we want. Uh, we're not fearing getting pregnant, which is holding a lot of younger ladies back. Um, and you know, we know what we want to ask for in the bedroom. So, you know, 
if it is something with discomfort, uh, again, there's a lot of things you can do to kind of get things prepped, but there's also the communication in the bedroom to take things slow. Maybe that connection is, you know, starting way out of the bedroom again. Like if she has no desire to even be in the bedroom, why, you know, does she have the partner that she wants to be with? That's a big thing. Um, does, you know, how does she feel about herself? Is she, like I just said, does she know what she wants, who she is? Is she comfortable in her body? Uh, does she feel good enough? Like I struggled with for like my whole life. Yeah. Um, and then right down to a couple of other things, you know, um, again, she's in her eighties. So obviously her is menopausal, not making the estrogen progesterone, you know, and sometimes that may have a, a, a place for it, especially when it comes to the vaginal tissues and making yeah. them happier. I have to say though, rock star Barbara at 81 and three quarters Mm -hmm. asking this question and not just residing to, oh, I'm in my golden years or what is considered geriatric and just being like, this is what it is. Like, get on out there and get you some. (laughs) You know, that's what you want. (laughs) I've seen it over and over and I love it. Like women in their 70s, 80s, um, who are really very active and Maybe widow, new partner, new husband, and they're just living their best life on yeah. so many levels, including in the bedroom. Love it. Well, Barbara, yeah. we hope that for you, and we hope that you are finding exactly what you need. Some great tips from Dr. Renee. Really good stuff. And stuff we, it, it's not, that's not just for those who are in their 80s. It's not just for the octogenarians. By the way, I mm-hmm. love that word. It was my favorite word on my SATs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it is for all of us. It's for all of us mm-hmm. to take. I mean, I'm taking taking notes right now like, oh, that could help me, you know, mm-hmm. as I'm, I'm entering the second half of my life. So thank you for that question. Mm-hmm. So this kind of goes along the lines of that. Kathleen from New York actually asked, are there natural ways to enhance the libido? I think you hit on some of those. And she says that she is one of them exercise, you know, mm-hmm. are supplements helpful? So mm-hmm. let's touch on that. Thanks. Yeah, Kathy. definitely. Um, a lot of things, you know, again, going back to how you feel about yourself, you know, and there's a lot of things that we can do coming down the road. I have a, this entire roadmap of things I look at with my clients and I, I call it, it's either my roadmap or there are roadblocks. And obviously starting with the foundation is, is again, how we feel about ourselves, how we feel about our bodies, because that can be the biggest block to get wanting to get into the bedroom. Like if you don't, if you're wearing baggy clothes and black all the time and you're trying to hide your body because you don't feel comfortable, that is something that we, and we're not going to solve that on this podcast, but that's something to start working on. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of books out there. Believe me, I've done years and years now of personal development books and, and courses and everything to try to like improve how I think about myself and my ability and all of the things. Um, and number two, you know, communication is always, you know, we're talking to like natural, like communication. Are you saying what you need in and out of the bedroom? So for instance, I have a lot of women out there coming to me super stressed that they're doing it all, especially now during the pandemic. And they're feeling like they're not getting any help from anyone, their partners, their kids. And I say, well, are you asking for help? Uh, no. I'm like, okay, well, they're not mind readers, even though you throw the dishes around or you slam the papers down, like they just think you're angry at something. <laughs> Men aren't that, I don't want to say they're not that smart, but sometimes they don't put two and two together that they're like, oh, she might be slamming that paper down because she wants me to do something. Or she might be angry at me because I walked in from the uh, work and slipped, popped on the couch and got on my phone. Like, mm-hmm. meanwhile, you're over there cooking the dinner, looking like you have it all under control. So we kind of, you know, if we shed this superwoman mentality, which again, I can say that because I've had it for years that I can do it all. I can do it better than anyone. Um, but I fall into bed at night exhausted without my trophy, except for my bragging rights. That's all I have. And so number two, communication. Are you saying where you need help throughout the day? So it brings your stress level down, setting boundaries, saying no to things that just aren't filling yeah. your cup. And, you know, the stress part, you know, it, that leads into stress. Like, How's your stress level? Because that's another huge one. I'm, I'm getting a lot of women coming to me saying, my libido fell off 18 months ago. Okay, what happened 18 months ago? Right, <laughs> let's know? go back to 18 months, not the now. Exactly. Yeah, and I'm not here in, the, in one episode, we're not going to say all uh, of how you're going to manage your stress, but like just identifying like, gosh, yes, my stress is through the roof. What is the awareness of what's stressing you out? What can we start taking action as far as managing that stress, um, setting the boundaries, communicating better all to help feed into hopefully a more improved stress. Mm-hmm. Now, a thing that everyone wants to talk about, supplements. Exercise, of course, is wonderful. Uh, it does a few things, you know, lifting weights, lean, increasing lean body mass in women actually will help boost your testosterone, your growth hormone, all the things. So really great. Um, obviously, your confidence too. 
Like, I don't know about you, but when I get done working out, I'm like, yeah, I think I look great. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, and you feel good. You get this natural like rush of endorphins. You feel happier. You feel better. And, you know, as far as supplements go, of course, nutrition plays a huge part. Like you said, my, mm-hmm. I have a hundred libido boosting foods on my website and, you know, healthy fats, uh, adequate protein, obviously, um, healthier carbs. I'm not against carbs at all. I just think if we can get the most bang for our bucks out of our carbohydrates, like your non-starchy veggies. Um, I love sweet potatoes too, which are starchier, but like pick and choose your carbs to make sure that they work for your body. Yeah. Um, and as far as supplements, um, there's a couple ways we can go about this. You know, one of my favorite is ashwagandha and people are like for libido. Yep. Because it, guess what? It's going to help your stress level. It's what they call mm. an adrenal gland adaptogen. And it actually will help, um, lower you. It will, it'll adjust your cortisol. So if your cortisol is low, it'll raise it, which is usually the case, or if it's high, it'll lower it. But right. essentially it just lowers you. It adapts your cortisol to where your body needs it to be to lower your stress level. So that Fabulous. is a wonderful, yeah, that's a wonderful one. Yeah. Another one I love is again, kind of coming off the stress because I know everyone wants to talk about the things that help boost testosterone and this, that. Mm-hmm. ladies, let's come way back. Like if we're stressed, like that would be great to do all that, but that's the icing on the cake. Let's talk about my two favorite for stress, the ashwagandha and L-theanine. Uh, L-theanine is an amino acid from green tea that actually calms you. It induces what they call alpha waves in your brain, which actually has this nice calming effect. Mm-hmm but it doesn't sedate you. And it's also great for focus, which is really important in the bedroom, right? But um, I find that, you know, when we don't, we don't want to take necessarily a prescription medication to help with anxiety. Um, But this would be a nice second, a nice alternative. I always called it my natural Xanax because it really gives you those same effects of really calming you and make you feel much more focused without making you feel like you want to go take a nap. Mm, Love that. Yeah. From a hormonal perspective, um, Oh gosh, I have two of my favorites. If we think you have too much estrogen on board, which can be from toxins or maybe perimenopausal years on top with with toxins, which can come from personal care products, how would you know this? Um, a couple big ways that I can always say if someone I feel it might be a little more estrogen dominant is if her periods are heavier, crampier, maybe more frequent. Um, she's a little more moody. Uh, irritable, lashing out, uh, and maybe weight gain, especially around the midsection, Mm -hmm. that could either be from a cortisol imbalance or maybe an estrogen imbalance. Two of my favorites for hormones are, uh, one is methane, which is essentially a compound found in cruciferous veggies um, that helps you break down your estrogens into healthier form. So it helps balance out if you think you have a high estrogen level. The other is Vitex, which is actually something that helps with the production of progesterone. So again, both of these supplements actually help balance your estrogen level, which I find for women, when it comes to libido, yes, I love, again, to talk about testosterone, but I don't think it's a testosterone deficiency in most women. I think Mm -hmm. it's an imbalance in our female hormones and overabundance of estrogen in relation to progesterone and obviously the cortisol issue. So I think that's the biggest. And then of course, if we want to talk about libido, maca, maca is always a great, a great one. Um, I was waiting for that one. (laughs) I have have a really funny story about maca though. I, uh, a few, gosh, I think it's when I first came into functional medicine and I'm looking, learning about all these cool supplements and such. And of course I have to practice on myself, right? Right. Well, maca in addition to being a libido booster is actually also an energy booster. Like it helps Mm -hmm. you with your energy. And this was when I was still recovering from my adrenal issues. And I remember I bought this amazing powder and I was drinking my smoothie every morning and I was actually on my way to an office for the day. And it says on the package, one tablespoon of maca powder. And I said, okay, well, if one is good, two must be better. Oh, so I put two in. I went to the office. By late morning that day, I was getting an EKG for heart palpitations because my heart was racing. So, and, and it's so funny because I didn't put two and two together. I had the EKG. It was fine. I did my heart. I didn't, I wasn't having a heart attack. I came home that evening and at dinner, my husband goes, cause he knew me at this point. He's like, okay, what new supplement did you start today? <laughs> And I said, maca. And I was like, oh, I shouldn't have used two tablespoons. I should just used one, like the serving size. So my my recommendation with maca is probably not even start at the serving size. Half it and see how you do with it. Because mm-hmm. it is, especially if you get a good quality brand, it is definitely potent 
for your energy. Um, I mean, I was not wanting to be intimate with my heart pounding on my chest. So that would right. defeat the purpose, right? So right. let the yeah. intimacy create the heart pounding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So those are a few, like covering the gamut of like, if you think that you have- Those are great. If your stress is really at the forefront of your mind, you can't. then maybe those two supplements I talked about, if you think it's more of a female hormonal issue, maybe the two middle ones and then the maca for the icing on the cake and the energy and the, the desire to get in there. Men find the same uh, yes. results from that? Okay, so yep. you guys can just have your maca shakes in the morning and whatever in the evening. <laughs> yeah, I also did a TikTok on like the five, there was ashwagandha and maca were two of them, but there were some others too that like I pointed out. So like there, you know, I have a TikTok oh, yeah. full video. This is great. <laughs> I was not expecting all of those. I knew a couple of them, obviously, from the work, you know, just being in the line of work as well. But uh, yeah. I wrote down a couple of those myself. Yeah. So thank you for sharing. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the next question. So we go back to something you were saying about the exhaustion. And obviously, mm-hmm. stress is a big thing. Mm-hmm. I, I see that a lot with my clients. They come in mm-hmm. and they, they're, you know, not feeling themselves. They're not feeling uh, as womanly. They're just, you know, so this goes back to a question that is being shared by Christine from New Jersey. How do you get out of the mom brain and get into the hot wife brain? Oh, I love that question. So good. Go for it. Yeah. yeah, It's uh, we all can live in mom brain 24 seven if we want to. Right. And I think a lot of the mom brain has to do with not being in the present moment. And I can say that because I'm a mom, I'm a mom to teenagers who's often in the mom brain. Um, but I do find that you have to be, in the beginning, I think you have to be very intentional about shifting out of mind brain and being present in the moment with your partner and saying, okay, this is our time. Let's not, because I, I hear a big thing with moms is even in the bedroom and when they're in the middle of, of being intimate with their partner, they're thinking of the grocery shopping and what's for breakfast tomorrow and making the lunches and what do I have to do? Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Let's get present, right? Let's because a lot of women then have um, have a difficult time reaching orgasm and such because they're thinking about everything else under the sun, but what is going on in their body, how something is feeling, and and the good time that they're having at that moment. And so, I really would recommend possibly just again being more even when you're a mom, being more present in the moment of being a mom. I think we do that too. Like I I often catch myself like. I'm in the middle of making dinner. What do I have to do next? What do I have to do next? Okay, no, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to chop this vegetable and just be in present, what, chopping my pepper, you know, like just practice being present. Like my kids come in, I'm present talking to them, maybe while I'm chopping a pepper, you know, like just practice being in the moment. It's really hard. I mean, for so many years, I lived in what didn't happen in my past, right? Or yesterday or during the day at night and what is happening tomorrow, Very few people I think are actually like, like I am today right now with you. Like I am here with you. I am not thinking about what's going on in another hour, you know, and I, and I really try, and it's been a practice. I'm that person also that can always live. Okay. I got to get the kids at three. And that's when my mom boots kick into, you know, like, but, and you can kick into mom mode and be living that present and and future and past and whatever you want to do in those couple hours. But when it comes time to the sun going down, if that's your time to be intimate, really make it a point to say, okay, if you have to make your list of what you have to do tomorrow, put it down on paper. So you don't have to think about it during your, your time with your partner. Right. Um, potentially like make it maybe even a ritual of like, okay, maybe I'm going to go take a shower and get into something that makes me feel pretty or, you know, put some essential oils on. I don't love perfumes, but some body oil or save the body oil for when you're your partner. Um, you know, something or go take a, a bath with some Epsom salts and some nice like lavender essential oils, another great one for libido because it's relaxing. So go do that pre and then go. And if it's again, if it's in the evening, like, or have some sort of ritual, perhaps that's going to shift you maybe in the beginning, you need something that will physically shift you. Okay. I'm switching out of mom mode. When I take my shower or when I take my bath, that's when I'm going into hot wife mode. I'll come out of, you know, maybe go treat yourself by something that makes you feel sexy from Victoria's Secret and, or a new toy or a new lube or whatever, whatever you is going to do that for you to say, okay, this is going to be our time and really make a date. I think so many people have allowed their relationships to take a back burner during the pandemic because there was not a whole lot of time of being alone, especially if you have kids in the house, you know, no one was going out, no one was having their date nights. Um, no one was actually scheduling time to be together. And 
you know, day went into night, went into the next day. And we're just not having that quality time with our partners, not only to connect physically, but to connect emotionally and to talk. Like, you know, there's so many relationships that have really deteriorating in the past 18 months because of that inability to have their privacy. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, we got to make time for ourselves and each other, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And I love that you touch on the essential oils too, because I use those regularly, but yeah. um, lavender obviously is one. Love Neroli, Ylang mm-hmm. Ylang and um, oh, Jasmine. I mean, if you're going to, mm, if you want to bump things up, if you want huh? the, if you want the guy to be like, what's going on here? Those are the ones. Trust me on that one. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Ylang Ylang is a, is a known oh, after yeah. this I known love it. Video. That was a little fraction of coconut oil and you are ready to go. Oh yeah. And yeah. you know, I've, I mean, get some, some fractionated coconut oil with yep. lavender, let him massage. Mm-hmm. If you're not in the mood, let him just start touching you, like massaging your legs. Maybe it goes nowhere. Maybe like, if you're like, oh, I don't want to. Okay. Just like let him massage you. Cause men just love number one, they're visual. They love seeing their, their partner in their own essence. And number two, they just love, I mean, the touch for you and your partner is mm-hmm. so essential for that connection and that oxytocin. Yes. And maybe it goes no further, but I doubt it. I doubt by the fact, you know, if he's <laughs> like true. massaging your thighs with this really yummy essential oil that you're not going to want to do anything more. You're going to be like, get over here. <laughs> I second that. <laughs> I third that. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. One more question. Okay. This is from Lee, who's in South- Southern California. And she said, how do I overcome the thought of it's so much effort that it's, or how do I overcome that thought that it's going to take so much effort to boost my libido? Well, I think that comes from just that fatigue, that stressed out mom, or not even mom brain, stressed out woman brain right now, right? Like we're all just, you Mm. know, and especially I, I, there's so many different levels. Um, you know, we moms out there, I've seen that they, we, we have our mom roles, but there's so many other roles that over, not even over the 18 months, over the years, the decades that we've been piled on all these other roles, like not only the household quote, quote duties that are so stereotypical of being something that mom has to do, but like all of the others of either working outside the house, maybe you had to move your, your job home. Maybe you're trying to add an extra income. So you took on a second job, third job, fourth job, who knows? Mm-hmm. Um, and so you know, I find the stress level is through the roof, as you said, also, like, I think that's the biggest thing over the past 18 months, it was prevalent prior to COVID and the pandemic. But right now it's like, and I think we're just so used to it that we are not identifying that that is a component of a lot of underlying conditions, including a low libido. And so just by her question saying like the effort, it's like, she sounds like she probably doesn't even have the effort to get through her day. She's, she's functioning like I was in the past of like, I, you know, I can't get out of bed in the morning. That alarm goes off. I'm like, Oh, why do I have to get up? You know, you drag through your day. Maybe you live on some caffeine and caffeinated beverages to get through your day. I mean, so many people like joke is like on their eighth cup of coffee by noon. I'm like, that's not a joke. That's a problem. Like, unless you really like to taste a coffee, but most are using it for a stimulant. Yeah. And you know, maybe you're having the cravings and you're using the sugary foods to get through your day. And, you know, probably if she feels that's an effort, probably eating well is an effort too. Cause that was me. I can mm-hmm. say all this because it was me. Like I would literally open the fridge. I have salad mix in there and I'd be like, oh, too hard to make, turn around, go to the cabinet, open the cabinet and just take out the bag of chips because that was easier. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it sounds at a foundational, like, and, and, and I mean, being intimate, it shouldn't be hard, especially if you're having fun. I think a lot of women also find it's hard when they're like, oh, I got to have an orgasm in 2.3 seconds. Like women take time. And a lot of times it doesn't happen with vaginal penetration. No. It's with, you know, it's so like we have to understand our bodies. And many times, I mean, if you're going in there like, okay, let's just get it over with. Maybe we should step back and, and again, kind of address the issues on the outside of the bedroom before going in there. Because I really want you to have fun when you're in there. And the other big thing I didn't know was so prevalent for women is that they're not getting pleasured in the bedroom because of all the things we've been talking about. They're in their head, right? They're Mm -hmm. thinking about what's happening tomorrow. They're not in their body. So they're not, they're like, okay, just move on. I don't even want to have an an orgasm, you know, like, cause it's going to take too long. And so we're all up in our head about like future past, how long it's going to take, you know, all these expectations Mm -hmm. as opposed to just like being in the moment and like, okay, let's see what happens, you know? And you can always have fun with toys too. If you find that it's taking him, you know, get it out, have fun. Generally speaking, a lot of men enjoy helping you or watching you pleasure yourself, you know, like, so, and there's been so many women out there say, I don't know how to introduce toys into the bedroom. I don't want my husband to feel 
intimidated yeah, or that's a big know. one the intimidation that i've noticed is like yeah. that uh the giving someone a toy is almost like that if the, the the guy might say well am i not good enough and it's like no you're getting i'm giving you the control to please me like yeah. that's how you introduce it yeah yep exactly and you can use it with you know mm-hmm. like at, while you're being you know having sex or like before like you play with it and find out what's best for you but I would say in my experience, most men really, they're hesitant to introduce it because they don't know how their partner is going to take it, right? Mm -hmm. They don't want to be like, oh, oh, she's going to think that I don't want to pleasure her if I bring a toy in, right? Or like, there's just a lot of assumptions going on in the bedroom. Like, why don't we just have an open conversation? Why don't we get some things to have some fun with it and see how we like it, period. End of story. If you don't like it, don't use them. So this is a really good chance for us to also mention, I want to put this out there. Look, this podcast is not just for women, yeah. <laughs> as I have many men yeah. that listen to this podcast yeah. and uh, many that are of all, you know, all, all genders that they identify with or whatever. And I just want to say that if you're finding that this podcast episode with Dr. Renee Wellenstein, who is the libidoologist, I just love saying that, <laughs> uh, is resonating with you or you know someone or maybe your partner yeah. and you want to introduce this episode to them, consider passing it along to one other person that you know is going to gravitate to this, whether it's your sisterhood, your brotherhood, whateverhood, pass it along. It can make a difference. And you know, you have more to talk about with your friends or your partner or whatever that can bring us a much healthier sexual relationship into your life and eventually into the bedroom if it's not there already. So thank you for sharing that. I do want to go back and also say that Dr. Renee is also sharing her 100 top foods that are great for the libido. Hey, yeah. Yeah, and that's going to be in the podcast on the podcast page. 100 libido boosting foods. We mm-hmm. need that. We hear all about the immune boosting foods. I talk about that a lot. But let's talk about the other foods. And th- that supplement list was like kapow, dead on. Yeah. So happy that you shared that. That was a little bit of extra, extra. So thank you so much for everything you've been sharing. This has been really great. Yeah, and I just want to add one more thing. Talk yeah. about, you know, I know we don't talk about a lot about men and I do only currently work with women. I worked with men for four years, but here's what I have to say for the, the gentlemen out there listening. I have so many men that come to me, that message me, that are on my live videos because they're curious of what is going on with their partner. Yeah. They're feeling like it's a big blow to them that their wife, girlfriend doesn't want to be intimate. And I'm really here to say, it's not you. Generally speaking, it's not them. I have so many women messaging me. He's, I'm so attracted to my partner, but, right. And we have to get to the, what the but is, cause it's not him. It's about something yeah. else. So there are so many men in my world that are just seriously there to try to just get more information to help their partner. And so I think a lot of the things we talked about today, you know, a lot of women will take it. If you say, okay, listen to this podcast, they're going to be like, what are you talking about? You think I need help? But there are many women out there that are like, I don't know what to do. Let me, you know, help me because there's Mm -hmm. so many women out there too. They're saying this is causing my marriage to dissolve. Like I might get a divorce because I don't have a libido. And I'm like, this is what keeps me awake at night, (laughs) by the way, this is like, I need to do more to help these women and the men to understand that give us time and we'll get her back. You know, if it's not something integral with the relationship, we'll get her back. So yeah, love that. Love that you're sharing that. Listen to it with your partner. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, we have fun here on this podcast. So this is a really good episode. And, and if you could share it with your partner or one other person and just know that it's, it's not about, it's, it's not that anything's wrong with anyone. It's that there are ways that you can make things better in your own life and your own mental and emotional well-being. So I want to have a little fun with you. Speaking of fun, I love okay. doing this with my guests. We're going to play a little word play, Uh-oh. holistically <laughs> speaking. I'm going to throw out a word. It's mm-hmm. going to be a word that just came up in conversation. I don't pre-write these down. And I just want you to come back with one word that, that comes to mind, word association, basically. Oh, okay. Gosh. Okay. Take Get out of breath. my head, right? Get out of my Get head. Get out of your it's head. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay, here we go. You ready? Yeah. All right. Nutrition. Unhealthy. Appearance. Important. Injury. Bad. Babies. Happy. <laughs> uh, hormones. Imbalanced. Gratitude. Always. Libido. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> You almost want to end it there, but I'm not. I'm going to end it with sex. More. Amen. <laughs> that's my tr- that's my word association right back at you. Loved it. That was great. You're on it. I love it. I like, hi. 
<laughs> so super. I so, got out of my head and into my body. I was like, how do I want it? <laughs> oh, this is so great. Renee, this was such a pleasure. Again, just letting people know Dr. Renee Wellenstein. She is a libidoologist. Definitely check her out. We'll have all her links available on the podcast page, including the 100 libido boosting foods. And uh, I just want to say thank you for being here. And if you have anything, a final thought that you would like to share with listeners, I'd like to hold space for you to share that. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. And, you know, I want women to know that if you have a libido, that's not where you want it. It's not because you're getting older. It's not because it might be due to stress, but it's, it's reversible. It's not because you had kids or your menopausal, all those things that we're told that it's over. It's not, I'm here to tell you it's not over. And again, just like Barbara in her eighties, like I, I want to be just as active as Barbara in my eighties. I'm telling you right now, like and so we all, it's all achievable for any woman out there and man listening. I mean, I'm not going to exclude the men. Like, it's just, you got to, you got to ask the questions why, and then do a little work to figure out the why behind the low and get yeah. it high and more sex. Yes. <laughs> we should all be like Barbara. <laughs> we should all be like Barbara. That's going to be my saying for today. I want to be like Barbara. That's, that's the new hashtag. Be like Barbara. <laughs> I love, love it. to meet Barbara. Barbara, come no find me. Say hi. <laughs> all right. <laughs> We'll try to make that happen. Okay. All right. Listen, Dr. Renee, thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure. And uh, I look forward to seeing how this, uh, what where, what kind of feedback we get. I have a feeling it's <laughs> going to be pretty awesome. Yeah, so thanks. I agree. Okay. Thanks. Grab those top 100 libido boosting foods and make some magic, my friends. That download link and how to connect with Dr. Renee is on the podcast page. And if you would like to learn more about how you can use essential oils and the power of touch as part of your healing journey, reach out to me on my website at hillaryrusso.com. Go ahead, drop me an email or even connect with me on social media at Hillary Russo. I would love to support you. And if you found value from this episode, consider passing it along. And while you're at it, go ahead and subscribe, leave a rating and a review wherever your headphones take you. Holistically Speaking is produced by Alan Seals with music by Lip Bone Redding and recorded on Squadcast. Okay, it's time to put these takeaways into action. But first, let me say this. Thanks for listening. Be kind to your mind and don't forget to laugh.